If God created recently, there should be some scientific evidence of that, shouldn't there? This week on Creation Magazine Live, scientific evidence for a recent creation. scientific evidence for a young, a young Earth, young universe, young animals, young planets, all, all kinds of things like that. It's important to note before we get started here that no dating method can prove the age of the Earth or the universe or rocks, either young or old, uh, without making some assumptions. Assumptions go into every dating method and uh, nevertheless we can look at some things. We'll start with some biological things that kind of make you scratch your head and think, okay, these are commonly understood to take millions of years, but that time scale doesn't work. Right. So if you've got the millions of years of geological uh, evolution, slow sedimentation over millions of years, that buildup of the sedimentary rock, or versus, let's say, the young earth creationist model, what the Bible says that there was a global flood uh, which would lay down uh, layers very rapidly and the creatures get, get buried and, and fossilized very quickly. There's two ways of explaining the same data. Let's see what we see in the fossil record. We're going to look at a picture of a, of a shrimp. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, on the left of the screen, you're going to see just a modern-day shrimp, a dead shrimp. And on the right-hand side, you see a fossilized shrimp, nearly identical to the, to the shrimp on the left, except the, the one on the right-hand side is supposedly 150 million years old. Something's up with that, right? Either no evolution took place, and that's, that's not an option for the evolutionist, or that fossil was not produced 150 million years ago. Something's wrong with the time scale right. in that they, case. They can invoke evolutionary stasis. Well, evolution means change, right? And stasis means no change. So it's, 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 it's a silly phrase. But if mutations have been occurring in, for 150 million years in any kind of creature, it should, it should have no similarity to a, to a modern Modern yes, creatures. yes. And there's, there's dozens of examples of animals that have been, they're called living fossils. Right. Ants, horseshoe crabs, jellyfish, bats, the Wallamai pine tree. And, and there's actually hundreds more where it's like this shrimp, where you have something right. that looks, something living and something that's identical in the fossil record. Like the coelacanth, for example. This coelacanth, was, this was yeah. once used as an index fossil. They said, well, wherever you find a coelacanth in the rock layers, the thing's 60 million years old. And then they found a live one off the coast of Madagascar. You can go swimming with them today. So they say, well, how, how similar is the coelacanth to its, uh, you know, supposedly 60 million year old predecessor? It's, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same skeleton. It so hasn't changed at all. Something's wrong with the time scale there. Right. It, it makes much more sense that coelacanths were living recently and, uh, and, and no evolution is happening. Right. Something else we could look at, dinosaur bones are young. You can see here some fresh dinosaur bones. There's blood vessels and blood cells inside a Tyrannosaurus rex leg bone. Uh, and, <laughs> How can and it last for 70 million years? Th th that doesn't make any sense. Well, th this, by the way, was criticized. I've heard this criticism from, from evolutionists. That, that's not really soft tissue in a dinosaur. It's biofilm. You know when you get a bucket and you leave it outside for a while and it's got that scum around yeah, it? You know, that yeah. bacteria scum? That's what the evolutionist Mary Schweitzer was criticized. And now she went looking for more of this, by the way, and she's found it. She took, what, Jack Horner? I think that was the, the fellow's name. The famous that dig, famous yes. dinosaur yep. hunter. They found more. She says you can sequence the amino acids in the collagen she found from this, this other dinosaur. They've found soft tissue in dinosaurs several times now. Yes. That's totally they're against finding it. real soft tissue and blood vessels and blood cells and so on. They're, yes. they're all there. Uh, there's, there's other things that we can point to. Um, for example, uh, DNA extracted from bacteria that are supposedly 425 million years old brings <laughs> into question that age. Lazarus you, bacteria. You can bring them you, back to life after 425 million years. Why can you do that? Again, it suggests that the time scale there may not be accurate. If, it, it, yeah, how can it last yeah. for 425 million How years? about just, just the information in the human genome, right? It becomes more mutated uh, with each generation. Well. If it's mutating at such a high level now, over 100 mutations per generation, right. how could it possibly have been doing that for the last 3 million years? Since we evolved from apes, and before that it was other creatures, before, so right. we can't really stop there. That's why you've got population geneticists who are evolutionists writing papers now called Why Aren't We Dead Three Times Over? Or, or 100, 100, times, 100 over. times Over. 
And we, we did a whole show on this two weeks ago. You can go back if you recorded it, you know, you're lucky. But uh, yeah. there's, there's other things that we can point to as well. Mitochondrial DNA is a part of the DNA that's passed on only through women. Right. The entire world's population has the same mitochondrial DNA, which right. means the entire population goes back to one woman. If you look at the mutation rates in mitochondrial DNA, it, th th those rates, you can get sort of a date from when all that came back together, and you right. get back to around the time after the flood. Right. All of the world's population goes back within that time frame to a single woman. Interesting how much evidence supports the young Earth. It's often claimed that evolution is simply change over time. And since change over time can be seen everywhere, then evolution is obviously true. But highly qualified creation scientists say there is much more to it than that. For evolution to have turned particles into people, simple change over time is not enough. A special kind of change is needed, that is, naturally occurring change that adds new genetic instructions. No one has seen this special kind of change happen. Darwin's finches, peppered moths and adapting bacteria are all examples of naturally occurring change, but not one of them shows the addition of new genetic instructions. Not one of them writes any brand new genetic code specifying how to make some new complex feature, such as feathers for lizards, for example. And since codes and programs cannot write themselves, there must have been a designer for all living things. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. You know, we're just flying through some evidences that support the Bible's timescale for a recent creation, right. God creating in six days. Uh, look up creation.com slash age, and there's an article there that lists 101 evidences for a young universe and a young, a young age for the earth, young age for creation. Right. And uh, we're just going to continue uh, just, just throwing out some of these evidences. You can get the details on creation.com. Here's another one, tightly bent strata. I took this picture here when I was in the Grand Canyon. Look at how tightly that strata is bent at that location there. It's not broken, it's bent. How, how could it bend if it, if it was really that old, right? If, if, yes. if the rock had hardened completely. Right. Hard rocks can bend under certain circumstances, but if you look at the grains in there, they haven't been elongated. Right. There's no indication that those rocks were, were bent. bent in... Reheated and then bent That's again. right. That's right. <clears throat> Coal formation. People have been taught that coal takes a long time to it's form. supposed to be millions of years old. But in experiments that simulate natural forces, coal can form quickly. Um, in weeks for brown coal to months for black coal. So it, it doesn't take millions of years. We've got observable evidence uh, simulating what they would figure what the natural forces would have been to, to produce it. And um, long time periods actually could, could actually hinder the formation of coal because right. there's, there's more time for the wood to have uh, permineralized, etc. So it, it's, it's actually um, e more easily understood that the coal formed quickly rather than uh, for a long time right. period because it, the wood could have, uh, you know, hardened. So to yes, speak. the same thing could have happened with, the same thing can happen with oil. Oil can be produced very quickly, doesn't take millions of years. Right. Have they done experimental, well, they've done experiments and shown that, right? It happens yes. very quickly. Yep. And, and opals as well. Um, people think, well, these, these gems, these, you know, they must have taken a long time to form. But again, we've got uh, experimental science showing that it can happen in a matter of weeks. People can grow them uh, in, in jars and such in a matter of Th weeks. That's right. So maybe those big prices you're paying for opals, maybe, they, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, what, what that would do to the opal market in Australia, where they're, where they're so popular. Yeah. Instant petrified wood. That was a, a heading in popular science in October 1992, a number of years ago. At advanced ceramic labs in Seattle, researchers made wood ceramic composites that are 20 to 120 percent harder than regular wood, but they still look like wood. Right. So it, it's stone, it's petrified wood that this company is making commercially. There's a certain, a certain number of chemicals and so on, and they have this, this mixture, and they can petrify the wood for like hardwood floors or making furniture right. that's, that's way more durable than regular wood. <laughs> but again, the, the ingredient that's necessary to petrify wood is not time. Time isn't necessary. Right. I mean, we've got examples of uh, wood becoming petrified naturally, where you, you've got uh, fence posts, you know, the wires still through it, uh, yes. screw holes in it, all, all these types of things, axe marks still visible. And so it was, it was obviously recent, and it's completely petrified. petrified. It doesn't take millions, didn't of take years. millions of years. Erosion at Niagara Falls. I mean, that's been a big, uh, a, a, a big evidence, apparently, for millions of years. I don't know how they come up with that. But the gorge, the Niagara Gorge, as the falls eat away the... Uh, the cliff and eat the gorge upriver, 
you can do a calculation. How long would it take for the falls to get the, to their current location? It, it, it fits in very nicely with going back to the time of the flood, especially considering that there was an ice age after the flood. Creationists right. certainly accept that there was an ice age. Lots of evidence for that. And that would have resulted in increased flows through this area, very likely at the end of the Ice Age as the glaciers melt yeah. back. And evolutionist Charles Lyell actually tried to use Niagara Falls as proof that the Genesis account was, well, was yeah. wrong, he but he lied, data actually. And yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, how about underfit streams? You know, you see these, these large river channels, but the, the, the river or the stream the is quite bitty, small, bitty little river. but it's got yeah. this big, <laughs> big thing. And, and so uh, what, what calculations actually suggest is that the, the streams would have had to be 20 to 60 times their current District, the volume of water that would have had to create that, because you can't have this one little stream. It, there's no way for it to carve that Reducing out. Producing a huge valley, yeah. Right. So that means, well, if there if there was that much water there in the past, then then all that erosion that would have taken place quickly, right? Not slowly. Uh, so the Grand Canyon, for example, it wasn't a little bit of water over millions of years. It was probably a lot of water over a, a very short period of time. Yes, things like which that. Which fits in with the Bible very nicely. Yeah. The amount of salt in the oceans, even if you were to to, to you know, adjust all of the, the measured rates today of salt input and how, how the salt is escaping and right. so on, for maximum age, you can only get to about 62 million years. So if you started with no salt with no content, salt, and then you use today's rates. But that doesn't fit with evolution at all. You get, what, There's three billion another years problem with the time scale looking at that particular dating method. And we'll be back with more in a few minutes. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1-11 to or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. Okay, let's get back to some evidences for a young Earth or a young universe and let's go to astronomy. How about the recession of the moon from the Earth? Um, tidal friction causes the moon to recede from the Earth at about four centimeters per year. That's right. That's what we're observing. And uh, the moon and the Earth, the, you'd have to be touching. Uh, you know, uh, when you think about it, you just extrapolate backwards. If that's been going on for, for that long, the evolutionary time scale just doesn't work. And they would get so close inside the Roche limit, it's called. Right. And, and the gravity of, of the Earth would tear the moon apart. So, and, and that, it doesn't fit the 4.6. It, it couldn't have been receding for, for that length of time. For that length of time. That's right. Another thing, ghost craters, thinking about the moon. If we look at the moon here, uh, the moon is heavily cratered. And we see in some of the larger craters, for, uh, for example, here, this is the Mare Crisium, and there are ghost craters. You can see them there near the bottom of the screen, some kind of faint uh, craters. And what's happened there is, there's, there's a close-up of it, that, that arrow there pointing to a crater. So these massive areas, Mare, uh, were, were, were thought to be seas originally, the dark areas. And what happened was that's a massive impact that, that, that actually uh, caused lava to come up and fill in the crater. Right. But... There were other craters, there were other impacts happening during that time as the lava was filling up, and they've been partially filled. That's what you're seeing here in this picture, right. a partially filled crater. But those impacts could have only happened while that lava was still flowing. Right. Which means that all of the impacts, which are commonly understood to take a long period of time to get all the, the moon is heavily cratered, right. But very likely, those craters happened. Those those impacts happened at a very, in a very short period of time with right. these ghost craters. That's that's the idea behind that. Um, volcanically active moons on Jupiter uh, are consistent with youthfulness. Um, Galileo mission recorded 80 active volcanoes. If uh, if this these had been erupting for 4.5 billion years at even 10 percent of its current rate, it would have erupted its entire mass 40 times. Uh, yeah, little in, in that amount here. of time. Yeah, um, the, the, all all these things are supposed to be old, cold, and dead. 80 active volcanoes. It just doesn't make sense. There's another problem with this millions of year scenario for the uh, for the evolutionists. If we think of uh, the magnetic fields of some of these some of the planets. Uh, very, very distant. Uranus and Neptune, for example, have magnetic fields. Right. They shouldn't. Again, they should be old, cold, and dead. Um, the existence of short period comets with the orbital period less than 200 years. So, for example, Halley is uh, consistent with an age of the solar system of less than 10,000 years. So, you've got these comets, they're, they're whipping around and, and, and they're going to be losing mass. Uh, with every orbit. With every orbit. Yes. Oh, so, over time, the, 
they just shouldn't be there anymore. If, if this had been going on for millions of years, you, you shouldn't have these. As a matter of fact, the evolutionists have come up with um, this uh, idea of the, the Kuiper belt. Is that the how Kuiper belt, Kuiper the belt. Oort cloud, and the, so on? Yeah, the Oort cloud. So yeah. there's supposedly this this cloud out there that's spitting out these these uh, comets. The only problem is nobody's ever observed it. Yes, it, the observations it, are rather scarce on that one. So we we don't have data to support our theory that's a good argument against it so what we're going to do is we're going to invent this ad hoc theory for something that no one has ever observed uh, to to explain the data away right so to speak here's a picture of a supernova what you're looking at here a picture from nasa again uh, supernovas are the remnants the leftover kind of guts of a star after it's exploded we can make some predictions how many supernova remnants snrs in the in the column on the left there should we see if our galaxy looking at the milky way galaxy is billions of years old First stage, second stage, third stage. The third stage of the very oldest, very largest supernova remnants. There should be about 5,000. That's the prediction. But if our galaxy is on the order of six to 7,000 years old, look at the predictions. They're vastly different. We should not be seeing any third stage supernova remnants. Right. So here's the data. If we go to the astronomers now right. and, and ask them, okay, what are you seeing in your telescopes? Look at that. <laughs> The Milky Way is not billions of years old. Right. It doesn't work. And there's so many other evidences from astronomy and from biology, and, and we'll, we'll get into some of these uh, uh, just after the break, but um, God created recently. One of the basic tenets of science is that open-mindedness is critically important, and the evidence should be followed wherever it may lead. But some scientists say that we should not always be so open-minded and that some conclusions should not be allowed, even if demanded by all the evidence. They say that no matter how much evidence there is for ingenious design in life, in the structure of the universe, or in libraries full of encoded information in genomes, they must not even consider the possibility that God might have had anything to do with the creation of such wonders. One scientist said, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. But this simply reveals a philosophical bias against God. Many highly qualified scientists believe the Bible's account of creation provides a much better explanation for the existence and operation of the universe. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Now we're talking about scientific evidence for a young Earth. Often one of the scientific dating methods that brought, that's brought up to try to support an old Earth is radioisotope dating. Right. You find rocks and they have a particular uh, um, something radioactive in them and it decays over time into something stable. You measure those two amounts, the radioactive parent, the stable daughter product, and you calculate an age. Right. There's actually good evidence from that particular field that, uh, that argues for a young creation. For example, uh, carbon-14. Um, it, it's only supposed to last because of its decay rate, maybe 100,000 years. It, it's very radioactive, yeah, it shouldn't yeah. last that long. So anything that's supposedly order, older than 100,000 years that still has C14 in it, um, there's something wrong. E either your, your millions of years date is wrong or else C14 isn't, but, but we can measure its decay rate. You can find carbon-14 in coal. Well, coal is commonly thought, it had taught to be millions and millions of years old. Right. But if it still retains carbon-14, then it can't be can't millions be that old. Of, of years old. <laughs> One of your dating methods doesn't work. Um, fossilized wood, diamonds, you know, they, they find C14 in diamonds. Well, diamonds... Di diamonds are a real head-scratcher because yes. the hardest substance, the hardest natural substance known to, known to man... Very hard to think that it had been... Uh, uh, infiltrated, for, contaminated, for, contaminated in some way, from any yes. outside source. So yep. how can it possibly? It, it, it should have dissipated. It's a powerful argument that diamonds didn't form millions of years ago. They formed more recently than that. That's right. There's another evidence from radioisotope dating of rocks and so on. You have uh, deep in the earth in granites. You have these little crystals called zircons, zircon right. crystals, and these have been observed to have radio radioactive elements in them, uranium right. and so on, that decay over time. Now, whenever something decays radioactively, helium is a byproduct of this process. So we, we can use this as a dating method. If there's a certain amount of decay in these little zircon crystals inside the granite, we should be able to see the helium. If, if that decay happened quickly, the helium should all still be there. Helium's a, a slippery little sucker that, that works its way through the, <laughs> yeah. the matrix of the rock. It's not going to stay and there for a long time. It's not going to stay there. These the, uh, creationists uh, years ago in the rate program by, by ICR, they dated a number of these 
they looked at the radioisotope decay and saw that the equivalent of one and a half billion years of radioactive decay had happened. You measure the amounts, that's how much it happened. If it had been constant, it would have been one and a half billion years. Yes, but, but if, if that's true, all of the helium produced over that immense period of time would have, would have w worked its way out through the rock. But the helium was all still there, either in the zircon crystal or just outside of it in the surrounding granite. Right. Which means that decay has been accelerated. That amount of decay, the equivalent of one and a half billion years worth of decay, happened rapidly, happened recently. So when people are making assumptions, well, we can see the decay rate today, it's always been that way. Well, that's not necessarily true. You're only making observations of what you can see today. For example, I know recently they've been saying that solar flares from the sun may be affecting uh, isotope decay here on Earth. There was a, a, a report I heard very recently about that. So, you know, the jury's still out on that. But, but many uh, scientists are just flabbergasted. So you just don't know. And, and yeah. that's why we're telling Christians, if you're hanging your hat on one certain scientific method that seems to indicate this or that, Boy, best to go with what the Bible says than, than somebody's, somebody's theory. Right. How about human population growth? You've got less than 0.5% per year growth from, from uh, six people uh, 4,500 years ago. That would produce today's population. Yeah. The current growth rate is about 1.7% per year. I mean, if the population had been growing for, for 3 million years since we evolved to, to become humans or, yeah. or whatever like that. Where are all the people? Where How all come the we only have 7 billion people on the earth? There should be way, way more than that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but yeah, using very reasonable estimates. Yeah. Um, you, you think about the Stone Age. The Stone Age was supposed to be, a, what, 100,000 years long, and people during that time apparently buried their dead with artifacts and so on. Right. If it was really that long, we, we should be up to our necks in grave sites all around the world. <laughs> but the Stone Age could not possibly have lasted that long, right. uh, thinking about human population. But there's a lot, of, a lot of scientific evidence for a young Earth, human population, and, and the things we've, we've gone through very, very quickly already. Right. We've only summarized these things, right. kind of given the conclusions. I encourage you to go to that article on, on our website, That's right. creation.com slash yep. age, and you can just go through argument after argument after argument that supports what the Bible actually says about the age of the Earth. Refuting evolution is a powerful, concise summary that explains where the common evidences used to promote evolution in textbooks are wrong, while at the same time showing how creation is better supported by scientific observations. It will stimulate much discussion and help students and teachers think more critically about the creation-evolution debate, particularly the often overlooked differences between operational and historical science and how they relate to the topic of origins. Order your copy today at creation.com. Okay, well, welcome to the feedback section. Uh, we often get feedback on our website um, from either videos that we've done or, or articles that we've posted. And we had an article um, where we were talking to a, uh, a chaplain, um, and he was a theistic evolutionist. And so we, he, he, he'd written in, and we'd posted some responses, and uh, we received a lot of uh, overwhelmingly positive um, uh, correspondence from people about how we we had this dialogue with them yes. and stuff. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we received an overwhelmingly positive response to our exchange with the compromising chaplain Rodney M. Uh, see part one and part two, and you can you can see this. Uh, go to the website uh, creation.com. Does creation make the gospel a laughing stock? And then you can read the original uh, dialogue back and forth if you'd like. But Robert S. from Australia criticized our responses. His message is printed in its entirety, followed by a response by Gary Bates and Lita Costner. I'm going to not read uh, all of his response, but I'll just kind of set it up and you'll see where he's going. He said, I agree with the chaplain. Creationists are unnecessarily destabilizing the faith of young Christians, unjustifiably attacking science and the many Christian scientists who think differently from them, making the gospel, the Christian faith, and the church a laughing stock in schools and universities and alienating students genuinely interested in the Christian faith. So he's basically just saying that, you know, creationists, people who take the Bible as plainly written, who believe God created as his word says, yes. yeah. we're just doing a disservice to Christians and to the church and, and people yeah. are just laughing at us because we don't believe in science. 
Yeah, we, we do believe in science. If there's anything that creation.com shows, I mean, we're, we're, we've got scientists on staff. As far, in fact, as far as we know, of all the Christian groups around the world, we employ the most PhD scientists. Right. We're not anti-science. <laughs> and many of our scientists were former revolutionists. Right. They know the other side of the story. Yeah. Here's what uh, Gary and Lita, here's how they responded. With all due respect, we don't see how you could hold that view after reading the overwhelmingly supportive comments by Christians that have been published below both responses to Reverend M. At the time of writing, yours is the only negative response. All of the aforementioned respondents were saying that they were excited when they found out that the Bible can actually be trusted from the very first verse. Although you claim our view is a stumbling block, this seems to be a self-born perception that is not, not grounded with much experience if the testimonies are anything to go by. Many commented on how creation teaching actually opened their eyes to the truth of the gospel and led to them becoming Christians. Right. I think one thing, a comment that we could make here is I, I, I think that the, the first thing that new Christians, or one of the first things that new Christians should be given is, is a copy of our Creation Answers book. Right. Or, or a subscription to Creation Magazine or something. Or, yeah. or, or go to the website, read some articles there, to get a handle on the relationship between biblical truth and science, uh, scientific observation. Right. How do we understand those two things properly? Right. Because we can answer the scientific questions. Uh, yes. Versus, you know, uh, evolution, millions of years. We, we have a way of, of explaining all that. That's not a problem. But again, this person seems to have fallen into this trap of, listen, if we don't accept what mainstream science is teaching, people will consider us a laughing stock. And, and then let's face it, we get feedback a lot of times, and sometimes you get feedback that's <laughs> not phrased very nicely, so to speak. Yeah. You guys are morons, <laughs> yes. you guys are idiots, you know, why don't you guys pack up and go home, you, you, you know, you use and, and flat earthers and, and all sorts of stuff. But he, he's kind of buy into that. He's saying, well, see, that's why these people treat you like this, because you're not accepting real science. You're right. not. Folks, <laughs> dead people don't come back to life according to science. Uh, no. the, 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 don't conceive. They don't People conceive. don't walk on water. Yeah. And on and on and on. They use the same words. Yeah. If you believe that some gal got pregnant, you know, uh, without there being uh, any any human donor, you're a moron to a lot of these That's the way that they, 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 they talk. So it's not just in one area of the Bible. People don't respect you more because you believe in evolution in millions of years, but you still believe that the dead guy came back to life. Yes, yeah. And there's a word that's been floating around that, that is kind of, it, it's, it's contextualization, contextualization. Right. And so this fellow seems to be advocating the notion that what we really ought to do is, is since the world doesn't believe that God created recently. Let's downplay that aspect of Christian uh, of truth, right? And and we'll, we'll just kind of ignore that aspect of truth. It's it's kind of um, the Apostle Paul in uh, in Acts 17 when he went to uh, to talk to the Epicureans and the Stoics who didn't believe that physical people could rise from the dead. Right. He attacked their false beliefs. He didn't downplay that part of the gospel. He showed them where their beliefs were wrong and challenged them to accept a risen Christ, and that's what we need to do as well. Show people the truth of what the Bible says.